I'm very fortunate to have a, a patient, but a patient who's become more of a partner to us. She's a, an integral part of our teaching. She's become a friend. Her name is Jewel. Uh, she suffered an acute cerebrovascular uh, event, uh, but you'd hardly know it because she ran a marath uh, half marathon recently. Uh, she's a fitness buff indeed. And she has a very powerful story uh, that she tells, and uh, stay tuned because I think you're going to hear a lot more from her and about her as the years go on. Uh, but right now we're going to do the reflex exam, and as you probably remember, the ankle reflex was really the way this all began for us. It was the metaphor for how technique matters. So uh, I'm going to begin uh, by talking a little bit about the, the various kinds of hammers. I, I'm, I'm sure uh, many of you know, but maybe not all of you, that the reflex hammers originated first as percussion hammers. Percussion was developed by Ohnbrugger, and uh, people used to percuss using a little hammer and a pleximeter. And this was about 50 years or more before the reflexes were described. And eventually we abandoned uh, the little hammers for percussion because we realized that we percuss more to feel than to hear, or we do both. And the original percussion hammers became the first reflex hammers when Urban Westfall described the muscle stretch reflexes. This is not quite the first percussion hammer, but it looked like this. It was called a wind trick, and it became... Uh, one of the first uh, instruments used to demonstrate the reflexes. But really the first dedicated reflex hammer was this one. This is an American product, the Taylor hammer, and it became immensely popular. And uh, I feel somewhat unpatriotic to say what I'm about to say, which is I confiscate these when I see them. Uh, they really make it so difficult for the novice because they don't really have enough heft and they're hard to wield. Uh, they had some attraction. You could use uh, uh, the, this part as a tongue blade. Um, in fact, many of these hammers were designed for that purpose before people stopped doing that. Uh, there's really very few other merits that it has other than to give to your little nephews and nieces to pretend they're uh, you know, American Indians or something like that. We don't like it. This is another very early hammer. This is called the Berliner. And in case you're wondering, uh, this is, I have a collection, which uh, uh, I, I love collecting this, and friends who know me often will give me or donate to me their, their hammer. So this is a Berliner, a very early instrument. And you'll recognize some of these names. Uh, this, this model is called the Dejerine. It's named after the same Dejerine of the dejerine russi syndrome. Um, the hammer that you have in your bag is the Tromner. Uh, the Tromner was a variety very popular in Europe, and uh, an American went to Germany and brought it back to the Mayo. And it's become sort of the signature hammer of the Mayo Clinic. And when you retire in Mayo Neurology, uh, you get a Trumner. And it's, it's really good if you compare this, for example, to the Taylor. It has a wonderful heft to it, and it ha it's very much head heavy. It also has two very discreet heads, one for the uh, larger tendons or the periosteal reactions if you want those and these for the more discrete tendons or for pediatric use. Um, and then there have been many variations on the same. This is one, I don't even know if it has a name, but it has a little uh, gizmo at the end to check sensation. This was a very popular model when I was training. It's called a box and it has a little brush at one end and a needle at the other end. Uh, don't use the needle because we, we're now worried about transmissible spongiform encephalopathy, so uh, don't use the needle. This model, this shape, is called the uh, Babinski hammer. It's not clear that Babinski himself designed it, uh, but it's become called the Babinski hammer. Uh, this model, you can unscrew and screw in this fashion, and so it sits in your pocket in a, you know, in a, in a sleeker fashion. But when you're using it, you would actually unscrew it and do it this way. And then this model seems like a great idea. A uh, head that flexes, and then you unleash it like this. But in my experience, they don't, uh, they wear out fairly quickly. There are too many joints and moving parts to it. And so the, uh, and then there's some other interesting models that uh, Errol, uh, who you've heard from earlier, 
uh, bought me this, I think it was for Christmas, uh, a wonderful little model in its own case. I don't know where he got it on the internet somewhere. And uh, you open it up like that. It still has somebody's name on it. Isn't that cute? And uh, I don't think it has, I don't, I don't know what the name of this model is. If anyone knows, uh, please tell me. And similarly, he got me uh, this one and this one. And we had a, a medical, I mean, actually a design school student who came to me and we started to work on a signature hammer. And we actually began with the shape of a Porsche brake. Don't ask me why, but in design school, we have a very vibrant design school. The Porsche brake is uh, held up with some reverence. And so we began with this big folding brake and believe it or not, ultimately came back down to this, which works in good hands, uh, but I, it's not something I would recommend on the novice. So we've had a grand total of two that have been produced so far. You're looking at one. <laughs> but the hammer that I favor the most is the, uh, uh, this variety called the Queen Square Hammer. And again, to illustrate the whole business of the five-minute bedside moment and stories, uh, there's an interesting story behind this hammer. I had the uh, privilege of training both in Africa as a medical student and then when my education was interrupted by war I uh, eventually re began in India, all, uh, not all over again but I lost a year or two. But in Africa I had a wonderful clinical teacher by the name of Sir Charles, Charles Leithead, who later became Sir I believe. And he died fairly young uh, after I had left Africa and he'd left Africa. He died of liver uh, disease and I wonder if it was hepatitis B or C. He was a phenomenal teacher, and he would walk down the corridors taking us to see some patient with dramatic fever or something. And as he walked, he was a very tall guy, six foot three, pinstripe suits, and he would toss this. It would make about five circles in the air, and then he'd catch it. And uh, I wouldn't dare to try it. I don't think I've ever managed five, five twists. And we would walk behind him pretending to play the trombone as we, you know, he couldn't see us, obviously. Uh, and many years later, after he died, I wrote about that, about the, the wonderful experience of being taught one-on-one -on -one by, uh, by that sort of a person. And the investment he made in just five of us, uh, you know, might have seemed like a, not a good use of his time. And yet, look how it pays off. I've taught for 30 years now, my own five every other week, you know. And it's, it's a profound thing. So I wrote about that moment of his walking down the hall. And incredibly, his wife... Uh, saw what I'd written. It came out in Granta, which is like an Ameri uh, a British literary journal. And uh, she wrote to me. And uh, we arranged to meet, I think, one or two years later in, uh, in, um, in one of the railway stations in, in London, uh, Charing Cross or somewhere. And at the end of our lovely tea together, beautiful visit, she gave me his hammer. Aww. So uh, this is his hammer talking about an unbroken chain. And the other day, I mean, actually some time ago, I was at the VA teaching, and I left it in the VA. And, you know, by the time I recognized it, it was after hours, and I barely slept, and I, you know, got, up, got back there as soon as I could, and there it was. You know, nobody cared about something like this. <laughs> had, it, had it been a laptop, forget about it, right? And just for your own curiosity, uh, we don't use this at all. We just had this made as a, as a sort of a desktop paperweight. And uh, I guess you could use it to intimidate people. But the hammer that I prefer is this. I don't want to make too much of the hammer, but any hammer will do. But it has to have a decent heft to it. And we like this. We used to give this out to all the residents. But we found they didn't carry it because they, they didn't like it you know, sticking out of the pocket like this. I've gotten so used to it that I feel almost naked if I'm not being poked in my ribs by this thing. So um, we substituted the trauma. Okay, with that as a, as a little background, uh, this is going to be a demonstration just of the reflexes. And we won't do all the superficial reflexes. We'll mostly concentrate on the deep tendon reflexes. And this is such a good thing to do when you're teaching bedside medicine because it's so technique and operator dependent. The difference between eliciting a reflex and not can lie in the way you hold the hammer, can lie in the nature of your stroke. If you choke up on it and if your movement's from the elbow, you're just not going to get it. But if you hold it very lightly and let it bounce off, then you will accomplish you know, the stretching of the, the tendon, the activating of the muscle spindle, and all those 
wondrous things. So uh, it's a great metaphor. And um, what I'm going to do with Jewel's permission, and by the way, we're not always lucky enough to have a Jewel. And in that case, it's still possible to, to do a very nice morning report and reflexes if you can find someone who's hyperreflexic. So I typically get to morning report about five minutes early and try and screen as many house staff as I can <laughs> with one simple maneuver. I, use, I simply use the finger flexion reflex. So, Jewel, if I may just have you just put your hand on your thigh like that. So I have a resident uh, put, uh, who I'm checking. I just have them lay their hand on a table, and I'm, you know, I'm quickly running around testing them. And um, actually, let me stay on this side so he can see. And I have them flex their fingers just a little bit, not too much. I stick my fingers inside theirs and I tap my hand. Can you see her finger flexing? It's probably more prominent on this side, but this is not, this is a, a more pathological reflex. But I look for this, and anybody who has a brisk finger flexion or Wartenberg reflex, on, and usually on both sides, that person's very likely to be a good candidate for us to do uh, this demonstration on. But I'm really fortunate because today, I have a jewel who's actually hyperreflexic on one side and has uh, some, uh, some uh, hyper, even more striking hyperreflexia on the other side. So if you have to do this without a patient, find the hyperreflexic individual, and um, that's powerful. Okay, so every reflex has a root, and I call out the roots, and I make sure that the residents remember them. And the other thing that I like to emphasize is that we're not interested so much in the movement, even though the movement catches our attention. These are reflexes meant to look for muscle contraction. So you keep your eyes glued on the muscle you're testing, and if they other also have an associated movement, that's fine. But that's not what you're after. So I'm gonna actually start from head to foot. I'm gonna start with the jaw reflex, and the jaw reflex is actually quite useful. In someone with pseudobalbar palsy, the jaw will click shut uh, and most people, they won't do that. So I'm going to have you open your mouth. <laughs> I'm sorry. I won't hammer. I'm going to hammer my thumb. So I'm going to have you open your mouth all the way. Now close it halfway and just relax. I'm going to be tapping my thumb. You can't feel this, but I can feel a slight reflex. In a pseudobulbar patient, it'll click shut on you. And in someone with bulbar palsy, like motor neuron, neuron disease, nothing will happen. Uh, so that's the jaw reflex. But now the triceps. And for the most part, I don't fuss around about trying to position the limb just so, with the exception of the ankle. Uh, try and just get them relaxed. Try and get them wherever you find them. The biceps is the only one where we use our thumb as a mediator. That and the jaw. Everything else is a direct strike. So I've got my thumb on the biceps tendon. If I'm unsure, I just have her make a, make a fist, for, make a biceps for me. There you go. Put it back down. I just relax. My thumb is on there. My eyes are glued on the muscle. I don't really care what happens here. I mean, I do, but let's not lose sight that we're looking for a muscle contraction. So, so I'm seeing a nice contraction. I'm feeling it. I'm actually seeing some, something we call recruitment. I'm seeing the phenomenon of recruitment. She has some finger flexion. She actually has some other associated movements. Compare that to her other side. And again, this, what level is this, may I ask you? C5-6, thank you. So compare that to the other side. Pretty brisk. A little bit of finger flexion, but nowhere as striking as on the other side. So given that she's that hyperreflexic, it's very likely that she will have a number of other reflexes, all of which are Normal if they're bilateral, uh, but not if they're not. So she could probably have a pectoralis reflex. I can feel the pectoral contracting. You can see more recruitment taking place. We'll also do the brachioidealis. Again, it's useful to have them just relax. It's the same level. Uh, I'm aiming for the brachioidealis tendon. And there's recruitment and there's uh, you know, a fairly brisk uh, pr uh, pronation too. Compare that to this side. I'm sorry, I forget that the camera is on that side, yeah. So both of these are C5-6, and then the triceps. So the triceps, again, you can just take the patient as you find them. She's quite relaxed now. I don't need to move her around. I just need to maybe 
get behind her. Uh, I'm not sure you're going to see this, but I'll come to the, I'll come to the other side. This is on this side. I can see the muscle contracting and I can feel it. One more time. And I compare that to this side. If you didn't want to do it this way, you could also have the patient put their hand over you and just tell them, pretend you're leaning on a fence post. Pretend you're leaning on my arm, I'm a fence post. And you can do it this way. Again, the movement is nice, but we're really looking for the muscle contraction. This is C7-8. So we did biceps, brachioidalis, and triceps. And now we're going to look for the, uh, we, we, we were demonstrating on that side, the normal Wartenberg or finger flexion reflex. And when it's exaggerated, we call it the Hoffman reflex. Many different ways of doing this. Let me show you the way that I do it. Grab the middle finger and make sure the hand is loose. And simply flick the terminal phalanx. See if you can see the other digits flexing. So keep your eye glued on her index finger in particular. Did you all see that? Yeah? So this is a uh, abnormal reflex, finger flexion reflex. And it, it will not be anywhere as dramatic on this side. I think you'll agree. OK, good. And now I'm moving to the, um, to the knee reflex. And she's sitting comfortably. Again, no real need to position her in any way or do anything. It helps to find that, her, that she's dangling her feet. That's, that's good. If they were on something, we'd probably want to take it off. And students, we actually teach them to feel the patellar tendon. But most of us by now uh, can find it just by sight. And again, it's a matter of orienting your body very much like in surgery. You can't always get to the other side of the table, but you can sort of get your arms to be on the other side. So you just orient your body into whatever position it needs to be to get the reflex. Um, you all see that? I'm now going to lay her down and uh, focus on the ankle because, as we mentioned, uh, that is the metaphor for what we're going to do. How are you doing, Joel? Are you okay? All right. Thank you for being so patient with us. I appreciate that. So, um, and by the way, while she's lying down, uh, we could do the knee reflexes as she's lying down too. Uh, one, one easy way to do it is to put your hands under both legs, and lift them up, and make sure they're relaxed by doing this number. If they don't flop down on the bed, then they're not relaxed. And then this is a nice way to compare one to the other side by side. And I think you'll agree there's a little more hyperreflexia on this side. And she, she probably will have a adductor reflex, a hamstring reflex, but we're not going to get into all those. Uh, just focusing on the ankle, we have a couple of ways of doing this. Uh, when they're hyperactive, there's actually a fairly easy way to do the ankle reflex, which is to put two fingers like a bar against the metatarsal heads and just push the ankle back a bit. I'm watching the muscle. I see it contract and I also feel it push. I don't teach this much because this is actually unlikely to be positive unless you, I mean, if you're lucky. But if you, if you don't get it this way, I don't think you should give up. But the, the best way to do it is to use the leg on the other side to support you. So there are several ways of doing this. One is take the leg you're testing and cross it over so that the lower one third of the leg you're testing is resting over the upper one third of the other leg. And the beauty of this position is that when you do this, the forefoot becomes so floppy. You see that? They can't keep it stiff. Then I put a little bit of tension on it, eyes glued on the muscle. That's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it is, is simply to, if the patient's as flexible as she is, externally rotate the hip, flex the knee, and now the, re the leg is resting very comfortably on the bed. Put a little bit of tension. Watch the muscle. Again, a very nice reflex. A third way I see in some books, which always looks clumsy to me, but it might be your favorite method, I don't know, 
as you put the leg like so, it's balancing on the heel. You're putting a little bit of tension on the ankle and I'm going to say it works well. It's just not something that feels easy to teach. So the level for this is S1. The level for this is 2, 3, 4 or 3, 4. So those are the deep tendon reflexes. Uh, the superficial reflexes, when we were doing this on house staff, invariably the person who's got a nice finger flexion, uh, if it's a male, we'll always ask them if we can also do the abdominal reflexes. And uh, I don't quite know why, but when you do an abdominal reflex on a, on a male in front of 15, 20 residents, and the umbilicus does this shift over there, the room breaks out into laughter. <laughs> Nothing causes more amusement for some reason than a normal abdominal reflex. And the only point about the abdominal reflex is that it's lost on the side of an upper motor neuron. Uh, I'm going to close, uh, and John, it looks like we have lots of time so we can do questions for all three of the people who demonstrated. I'm going to close by showing you her, pla her, the normal superficial reflex that we most care about, the plantar reflex. It's, your, your choices when you do a plantar reflex are to describe it as being present, absent, or replaced by a pathological reflex that we call the Babinski response. So it's, it's sort of bad English to say they were Babinski negative. They either have a normal planter or they don't, or it's replaced by the Babinski response. And the best way to elicit that is to go along the outside of the sole and bring your finger up towards almost to the, ba the base of the big toe. Sometimes you can bring this reflex out better by having them turn their head to that side. And that sort of helps, does something with the tonic neck reflexes that might bring it out. And I'm not able to get it. If this was readily uh, listenable, sometimes you take the sheet off and the toe goes up and the, and the fingers fan. And there are many other ways of eliciting this, uh, Oppenheimer, Ganda, and so on. And the more ways you can get the toe to go up, supposedly the denser the hemiparesis, but we won't go into that. Um, because we're going to be uh, using Joel tomorrow for the exam, I just want to quickly point out one thing, and that is, as I do this, if you focus on both your feet at the same time, which foot do you think is wiggling more? This one, right? Yeah. So she has a little bit of hypertonia on this side compared to that side. It's actually quite minimal in the hand, but much more uh, noticeable in the upper limb. So I'm going to stop with that, and I think, John, uh, we have plenty of time for questions with all three of us. But I want to first uh, thank Jewel for being such an exemplary uh, uh, patient who set up. And the preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.